number one Iron Age booty daddy. The Supreme Court is now going to hear a case that is potentially going to radically alter content creation and how views are gotten on social media platforms like this very one you're checking out this video, YouTube. Ladies and gentlemen, this could be a very interesting turn of events and ultimately one that I'm not sure about, not sure about, not, I don't know. There's a lot here. Now, everybody knows the conservatives and the Republicans have been railing against Section 230 for many years right now, trying to basically get Google and YouTube and other platforms like TikTok and Facebook and Twitter all caught up in this idea that these platforms are not actually platforms, but they're publishers. But there seems to be another angle that the almighty all-knowing conservatives didn't see. And this is something that's very interesting and something that I have been thinking about in my own channel for quite some time. It seems that the Supreme Court is going to be hearing a case, is going to be looking over a case, talking about the curation of content for the viewer. Now... The reason this is coming up is because over the last, oh, five or six or seven years, it seems that content has been fed to users and things have been fed to users in such a way that in some cases resulted in death, sadly, in some cases has resulted in other things. And ultimately, the curation around the algorithm, or I should say the algorithmic curation, that these companies employ to get viewers to stay on YouTube longer seems to be the attack here, and they're using 230 to do it. There's a rather lengthy article over here on CBS News, so we won't cover all of it, but I did read through it, and I will give you my opinions, but just so you guys know what we're talking about. Over here on CBS News, Supreme Court hears a case that could reshape the fundamental architecture of the internet. Now, that's a little bit of a misleading headline. I would say possibly the architecture of content curation and uh, content viewership, but not the architecture of the internet. The architecture of the internet is actually very different than that. So that headline right there is a little off. All right. So Katie Morgan her, <clears throat> was a reluctant adopter of YouTube. Okay. She was a therapist working towards a license in California and, uh, it was suggested that she started posting videos on the platform. I am skimming through this to get ultimately to the point because this is a really lengthy article, okay? In 2011, Morton, like many others, thought that YouTube uh, primarily consisted of cats playing the piano and uh, makeup tutorials. But after seeing the content uh, posted on the site, Morton decided to give it a shot. Her audience started small, as do most audiences, and it's grown to over 1.2 million subscribers. Hey, that's fantastic. That's where I would like to be. Okay. The crucial growth of uh, Morton's audience is YouTube's system of recommending content to users, okay, which the company began building in 2008. It relies on a highly complex algorithm to predict what users will, what videos will interest viewers and keep them watching. Today, half of Morton's viewers come from recommendations, she said. Okay, and that right there in that snippet is the crux of the entire video and something that I've been talking about. So I have said in past live streams that one of the things that's really hard, especially for my channel, because I cover a variety of different topics and I like to speak my mind on a lot of different things, is that YouTube does not have an algorithm for content creators. They have an algorithm for viewers, right? You watch a video and YouTube says, oh, you liked that video? Here's the next video. Here's the next video. Here's the next video. Now, the what seems to be the controversy that is enveloping this whole thing is that YouTube has shown some videos to people. And in this article on CBS, it seems to have shown uh, uh, videos of, of terroristic activity to people. And that seems to be the thing here is that it's a curation, right? It's a curation algorithm for the viewer to make sure that the viewer stays online and keeps watching. However, the arguments being made right now is that the curation algorithm that YouTube and many other platforms like TikTok and Twitter and Facebook, these, these curation algorithms that these tech companies employ is actually showing 
videos and things to people that they have never watched before. In fact, I've watched many content creators before talk about going down the YouTube rabbit hole. They're sitting there, they're watching a video, and all of a sudden this this other video comes up and they just fall down the YouTube rabbit hole and they're like, I'd never, like, I'd never searched this stuff before, never wanted to watch this stuff before. One of the content creators I had said he was watching, he ended up watching like, like, like female pole vaulting or something like that. And he's like, I, or pole vaulting. I don't remember. And I, he's just like, yeah. And I, I sit there and I watch it. And he's like, I'd never searched this stuff before. And that right there is what this lawsuit is about and what the Supreme Court is going to hear and how it attaches to Section 230. Now, Section 230 came into uh, fruition about 27 years ago based off of what this article says here. So let's just take the article at its word over on CBS News. Uh, and I say that so you guys can go search it. But what it did is it tried to separate out the difference between a publisher and a platform, right? A publisher is somebody that goes out there and uses their name to say, we are putting this information out there with our name and we put our full backing behind it and legal recourse could be gone against publishers. Now, platforms simply just say, no, we just got a place for people to post stuff, but we don't curate, we don't moderate, we don't decide you know, how popular that thing gets. So if those people are doing something wrong, we have no liability. We're simply just the soapbox that people stand on. And a lot of people have been saying for many, many years that um, YouTube <clears throat> and uh, the other t tech platforms, I won't keep naming all of them, has been absolutely censoring a certain political ideology that they disagree with. What is so interesting about this lawsuit is I've never heard of a lawsuit that's going to be heard by the Supreme Court that attacks it from the curation standpoint. Because that is interesting, because we're not talking about wiping out content creators and silencing individual content creators, which seems to be falling on deaf ears. But now what we're talking about is directing and guiding and censoring what the individual person may see. And that is very interesting. Let's play out this fantasy where the Supreme Court decides that the curation algorithms are in fact in violation of Section 230. And by being in violation of Section 230, if you curate what the viewer sees you are no longer a platform you are a publisher and can be held liable for what your algorithm has shown to the viewer thusly meaning that god forbid somebody falls down a terrible rabbit hole gets radicalized by somebody and goes out and does some heinous things that could be brought up in a lawsuit and that could fall back on youtube how does this change the entire way that youtube and content creators function. Ultimately, we go back to, I believe, a merit system, right? One of the one of the things that's good about this and the other thing that's bad about this, and let's cover both, the merit system means the cream will always rise to the top, right? Well, when the cream rises to the top, a lot of people just show up to those platforms to watch that stuff, right? For instance, Rumble. I Every one of my videos on YouTube goes over to Rumble. It's over there the next day. Now, when it's over on Rumble, I get maybe, I think one of the highest videos that I have over there is like uh, 2,000 views. Uh, and most of my videos get anywhere from one to six views, right? Because people don't go to Rumble to watch a drink with crazy. People go to Rumble to watch other people, such as like Steven Crowder, Ricada Law, Salty Cracker, these major political commentators. Well, I guess Nick Ricada is not really a political commentator, but he somewhat fits into that space. So the idea here is that the meritocratic system would take back over if YouTube could no longer use its curation algorithm. However, the bad part about that is, and I will be playing devil's advocate here, channels like mine on YouTube would almost never get seen. Because you would not even know that a channel like mine exists because the recommendation feature for what you have told YouTube that you want to watch would exist. So the people who were checking out the ISOM videos back when Eric July released his comic book that blew the doors off of the comic book industry. When I did my video, it blew up. It was insane. I couldn't believe that that first video that I did on the ISOM universe and what Eric July was doing garnered that much viewership. 
And what it was is that the keywords were right, the popularity of the topic was right, and YouTube recommended me to a bunch of people. So take that away, and what we're going to see is the people who are there and established are probably going to stay there and stay established. And the people who are not established are going to have to work harder to become established. That's not a bad thing. That is not a bad thing, but that is potentially what I see happening here. So by not just attacking and saying you are absolutely going after a political side. Remember, politics, your political viewpoint, not protected by Section 230. So they can nuke people off the platform all they want. It's not a protected thing. They incited violence. They said things because, again, they change the term of violence all the time. But now all of a sudden, the small creators, the people who m might do something that you really like, this little tiny channel here that you are viewing right now would never show up in your recommendation feed. And how does that alter the landscape of the online content creation economy? Ladies and gentlemen, this is going to be something very interesting to watch play out, and I will do my best to keep tabs on this story as best I can. But let me know down below what you think, because I do my best to go through all of my comments every Sunday on a live stream that I dedicate to all of you. It's called Sunday Coffee. It's where I go. I get my cup of coffee. I pull up your comments. I get you guys in the live chat, and we go through the comments together. And you guys get my reactions to them, my answers to them. And if you guys need to go in it and berate me and tell me how wrong I am or the fact that Royce, you shaved and you need to grow your beard back, you can. So ladies and gentlemen, let me know what you think. Don't forget to like and subscribe to this vid. Like the video, subscribe to this channel. Good Lord. And never forget. Until next time. Cheers, everybody. Thank you all so much for checking out this video. Never forget, if you would like to be a part of my supporter live streams, head over to my Gilded or my Locals. Links down in the description, and you guys can join me for those live streams every single Wednesday. But right now, I would love to say thank you to everybody who is supporting me. Over on Locals, we've got Little Andean, Sword Rush, Frequency Studios, Katie Francis, Kikomon, Iron Age Media. We also have... Over on the Gilded, JP, the Myriosphere Origins, Skunk's Workshop, and the Gold Tier, he is an Iron Age booty daddy. Trippy Soul, also another Iron Age booty daddy, Kiko Mon, and Frequency Studios to round all of it up. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being here on the channel, and I will see you all in the supporter live streams.